in computer graphics to uh, actual fabricated objects. Um, and what's interesting to me is that I actually started computer graphics out of frustration. Um, my father is a mechanics, and his hobby is to create this kind of um, full metal gas powered engine. And this is a, a picture of one of the machines uh, we, we had at home, so I grew up around such uh, crazy meaning machines. And the, the problem is, as a kid, I wanted to do things with it, but of course it's way too dangerous. It requires years of training, so this was out of the question, right? Uh, and obviously it was much easier in the computer, so I turned towards the graphics and started to make objects in the, in the virtual world where things were apparently much safer. Um, and, and that's what I did for, uh, for a number of years. I became a researcher in this field. And then maybe seven years ago, uh, these do-it-yourself 3D printers started to appear. And for me, it was really a big game changer because you could buy this printer, put it on your desk, everything was open source, so you could very quickly turn your code that was generating virtual objects into actual physical objects. And so I decided that you know, I should try to do something there and make some, uh, uh, some uh, cool and, and, and hopefully interesting objects. Um, and so when I thought about what can I do to contribute to, to this uh, effort, um, it seemed to me that the space where things were really interesting was to try to generate very complex geometries. Because with additive manufacturing, you have the possibility to fabricate things you couldn't do otherwise. And in graphics, uh, we have all these great tools around texturing to be able to deal with such uh, shape complexity and to deal with a profusion of details. So uh, before, like, to understand this, we have to go back to the roots of, of what textures are in graphics. The reason we use textures is because if you represent geometry in the computer uh, through uh, smooth shapes, such as this ellipsoid here, and you simulate the way the light bounces on these shapes, and the, because you're interested in tracking the light that will come to your eye, right, your virtual camera, to make a virtual picture of the scene, when you do that, using perfect uh, equations, you get very smooth renderings. And everything looks very perfect and very artificial, so that's not good, because of course in reality all surfaces have little imperfections. Uh, and these little imperfections is what makes them look realistic, what, made, what makes you perceive that you have a surface made of wood, marble, or, or any material uh, you can imagine. And so very early researchers uh, looked at ways to represent these small-scale imperfections along surfaces. And in, in, in graphics, what we're interested in are properties such as color, normal, specularity, and opacity. So this is what we try to encode in these textures. And if you look at um, any, actually any computer graphics application, uh, from games to, to movies to, um, I mean, anything that relates to graphics, you will, you, you will have textures. Uh, here is a screenshot of a video game. On the left, you see the actual geometry of the scene, which is represented using triangles. And on the right, you see uh, the final picture. What's uh, interesting here is that if you look at the amount of details of the final pictures, you can see that these details do not translate to an increase in geometric complexity. You still have very few triangles on the ground compared to the amount of detail you perceive. And that's because we found ways to encode this, these details and this complexity in a way that is very efficient. So how is this relevant for additive manufacturing? Well, in additive manufacturing, we're uh, very interested in representing small-scale heterogeneities, may it be complex, void, solid uh, structures inside the volume of an object, or may it be for multi-material uh, printing, for instance. Um, and of course, the interest is that these heterogeneities are going to change the behavior, the physical properties of your object. Still, you might be interested in uh, generating some patterning on the surfaces, for instance, to create tactile feedback for grip patterns or for colors because we have uh, 3D color printers, so that remains relevant. So what I'm talking about is being able to do this kind of 3D shapes that you can uh, fabricate on a 3D printer. You couldn't do that otherwise. And the way the, the material is structured inside, this, these details you see uh, internally, they, they play a role, right? They're gonna make the object lighter while strengthening the object. So we, that's why I'm, I'm talking about functional details, right? Um, but what's important as well is that by changing locally the pattern, you can also trigger some global effects in the objects. For instance, this plate here, you can see there's a subtle change to the pattern at some locations, and the effect it has is that if you bend this plate in one direction, you get a U. If you bend it in the other direction, you get a C. And that's due to these local changes in the patterns. So why is that difficult to represent <coughs> small-scale small scale variations? Well, the way I like to look at it is you have to solve for three different problems. The first problem is storage. This relates to how you're going to encode your details and store them in the computer memory. The second problem you have is access to this data because you need to render on screen or you need to extract a slice for fabrication. So you need to access this data. If the, if the data is very large, it's going to require a lot of bandwidth and everything is going to slow down. 
And the third one, which is, of course, very important, uh, and perhaps the most important, is how are you going to author this content? We're talking about details, and the thing with details is that you have a lot of them. They're small in comparatively large volumes uh, or along comparatively large surfaces, so you might spend a lot of time specifying these details, and we'd like to have methods to uh, help designers do that. Now, the thing is, these three problems are not orthogonal, right? There is a, a lot of interplay between them, and if you choose some way of representing your data, this will impact the way you author this data. And so we are trying uh, to come up with approaches that will you know, have green lights in front of all of these three problems. So to understand this, let us first look at uh, storage and access, right? So let's say I'm, I'm doing a, a computer graphics application, and uh, here's a triangle, and the only thing I can do on this triangle is to give it a solid color, right? So it's going to look perfectly homogeneous, and if I want to generate more information, to paint some colors along this triangle, the only choice I have would be to subdivide this triangle into smaller triangles, and then I can give a different color to each of these triangles, right? And this would work, but it's a bad idea, and the reason for which it's a bad idea is these additional triangles you're, you're putting in your, in your scene they're going to be a big burden for the entire rendering pipeline because the rendering pipeline has to go through all the triangles, determine which ones are visible, project them on screen, do all sorts of geometric computations, and now you're doing that for all the details. And also in terms of storage, it's very wasteful because we're adding all these triangles and their x, y, uh, z coordinates, the x, y, z coordinates of the vertices have no information because they're still along the same big triangles that you had initially. You're just using them for adding colors, right? So it's super wasteful. So that does not scale, and clearly we don't want to do that, and we don't do that in graphics. Now, if you think about it in additive manufacturing, we constantly do that. Uh, here is an object which is at the bottom left, and I've added some uh, textured pattern inside it, right, which is this weird waffle-like 3D shape. And now if I want to represent this to send it to my printer, well, what I have to do is to generate this huge STL file, which is not even a good mesh if you look at it from close, and for this 27 millimeter height object, it's 5 million triangles, and 260 megabytes of data. So this absolutely won't scale, right? And of course, you could do a better mesh, right? I mean, this is a, a very poor mesh. We have much better meshing techniques, but then it's going to take time. If I change the parameters of my internal structure, I have to recompute everything, and it's going to uh, you know, compute for minutes, and, and that's not good. So what's the trick? How do we manage to avoid this problem in, in, uh, with texturing? Well, there is this very important idea that, that really goes back to the early days of computer graphics, which is called texture mapping. And the uh, important thing here is that it's meant to separate the high frequency details that you're trying to represent um, uh, along the surface from the actual geometry of the surface. Here's how it works. You have the same triangle, and the vertices of this triangle have coordinates in x, y, z, right? These are your world space coordinates. Now you're going to add a second set of coordinates to this triangle, which, are, which we call UV coordinates, and they define the triangle in a different space, which we call texture space. Think of it as an image, right? It's a bit, it's a bit easier initially. Now, when you render the triangle on screen, what's going to happen is that for every pixel of the screen, and this is a big triangle, right? The screen is a black outline. For every pixel that is covered by the triangle, and only for those pixels, you can uh, get the 3D coordinate that is behind the, the, the pixel, which belongs to the triangle. And from there, you can interpolate the UV coordinates within the triangle and fetch a color in texture space. And the thing is, you're only doing this for those pixels which are covered by the triangle. If the triangle is not on screen, you pay nothing. Your details have no cost, right? So uh, this is great because it allows you to pay only for uh, what you have on screen. Now, how does this translate to additive manufacturing? Well, let us assume that your object is made uh, of tetrahedrons. So tetrahedrons are the, equi the 3D equivalent of a triangle. This is the simplest linear uh, 3D element you can come up with. Um, if a tetrahedron, which represents a, a, a part of the volume of my object, ends up on screen, then only for those pixels which are covered by the tetrahedron, what I can do is compute a ray through the tetrahedron, translate this ray into texture space, where I have my heterogeneous uh, texture definition, and then I can walk along this ray. So let's assume I start in empty space. I'm walking along this ray, and as soon as I hit a point which is solid, I can stop. And I don't, I don't have to go further. I don't have to go behind if I do that front to back, because, and because my object is opaque, and then I'm done. Okay? And again, you're only doing this for those visible rays. And here is 
what happens when you do this, this is a, a slowed down rendering in our software. And you can see the same waffle structure, but this time it's pixel accurate because this is done for every pixel in real time. And the only thing you have in memory is the original outer uh, mesh definition. And the rest is actually a, a mathematical, mathematical function. So you don't even need to, to store it as a bunch of data. Okay. So now there's more to it because it actually works for slicing. If you slice a tetrahedron, it turns out that uh, you will end up with a triangle, and this triangle will have uh, a definition in texture space, and then it's a simple texture mapping problem where you want to paint uh, along this triangle in screen space, in slicing space, right? The, uh, the, the solid texture that is defined in the texture space. Okay, and the graphics hardware will even do it for you. So you basically have nothing to do. You can use the graphics API. So texture mapping is great because it, it, it really goes a long way to solve access in the sense that you only pay where you are actually doing, uh, using details. Now, in terms of storage, well, that really depends, right? That depends how you encode your textures. Um, if you're using what I, what I call here explicit textures, then you're going to encode your uh, images or your block of material as a 2D or 3D grid of either pixels or voxels, right? And this can become huge, right? because if you have a lot of them, of course, this quickly takes a lot of memory. Now, on the other hand, it's very convenient for authoring, because we have great tools to paint pixels or to uh, deal with voxels. You can even scan uh, this if you have the, the appropriate equipment. So that's very convenient. But there's another way to express uh, a, a texture. And this other way is uh, what is known as procedural texturing. And this is an implicit representation of the texture. The idea is to replace the image or the, or the block of material by a function. This is function f here. And the, 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 the idea of this function is that it's going to compute the properties locally from the UV coordinates of a point. Right? So for instance, it's going to compute a color from the coordinates of a point. Okay, and what's great about this is that you're completely exchanging memory for computations. And historically, and it's still the case today, you have much more computation capabilities than you have bandwidth to the, to the memory. Right? So using computation is always a good idea, um, within some limits, of course. Uh, and the other thing that is good is that it's resolution independent. If your function f is smooth, as you zoom in onto your content, you won't run out of resolution, right? because it's an equation, and it will always compute the things at the best resolution, pending floating point numerical issues that you might have. All right, so that sounds great. So the problem is, how do you create those? How do you write a piece of code that does something meaningful and returns a color? And I'll come back to this later. We'll, we'll see um, how it's possible. Now, I've described the fully explicit things. These are voxels and pixels. The fully implicit, these are pure functions. It's important to keep in mind that very often you're in between. And there's actually one methodology you probably uh, know about, which is, which is in between. And this is what is done in most video games. This is at the top here. Uh, what happens is that to mitigate the cost of explicitly storing an image, we store a smaller image and we repeat it, we tile it along the surface. And in graphics, this generates this kind of artifacts where you can see these lines appearing. These are due to low frequencies that shouldn't be there and are a bit painful to the eye. Computer artists are very good at hiding this, but you can really spot them in most uh, video games. Um, uh, because, because there's no free range, right? If you store this gigantic image for the landscape, it's going to cost gigabytes of data. You can't do that, so you have to mitigate the cost. Now, in additive manufacturing, we do that a lot as well. Um, we uh, very often define internal structures through representative volume elements, which is a small brick uh, of texture, and you repeat it in a periodic grid. So it's great for access and storage. It's also very good because there's a tool known as numerical homogenization that will compute the equivalent parameter of the homogeneous material uh, given the representative volume element. So that's one other good reasons to do that. Now, there are most more advanced techniques, both in graphics and additive manufacturing. So uh, one technique in graphics that is quite popular to avoid these repetitions is to construct a set of tiles. And these tiles have boundary constraints, right? So these are the red and blue edges. And this define a puzzle. And this puzzle, you can actually uh, generate randomly at runtime during rendering. So this is the implicit part, which is this random assembly. And it will produce something that looks a bit more natural. Now, in additive manufacturing, we have something very similar when it comes to uh, grading material properties, uh, which is very important, of course. And the idea is to do families of tiles with compatible boundaries from which you can choose uh, to compose your internal structure. Right? So you can see there's a lot of correspondence between both. OK, now let's switch to authoring. How can we specify these textures? So we'll start by uh, talking about explicit textures, and then we'll move to implicit. So like I said, you could, of course, uh, scan and paint, and that's definitely a possible option, but it can be very, uh, very tedious. In particular, imagine for computer artists, 
they have to paint square meters of pebbles, grass, concrete, and so on. This is not the most interesting part of their job, right? And so in graphics, very uh, early, we started to think about ways to simplify this. And the idea is to uh, uh, create algorithms that are able to optimize larger images from small uh, samples of a texture you want. So in such a case, what happens is that the uh, artist defines a small sample, and the algorithm automatically optimizes a larger image that everywhere resembles the samples, but has no obvious trivial repetition of the content, in the sense that it's not periodic, right? Uh, do not confuse this with procedural texturing, right? This is pre-optimized. It generates an image, and the image is explicitly stored in memory, right? It's just that it avoids having you to paint everything. And now we have tons of techniques in graphics to do that. For instance, this is a one that we developed where you can uh, synthesize the pattern along the surface. Very convenient to give the pattern the surface, hit a button, get a result. And then there's a lot of user control. You can choose the orientation of things, the scale of things. So it's highly uh, controllable, which is important for a computer artist. We also have uh, intriguing things, such as this case where we uh, generate solid blocks of material from 2D examples. Here we specify zebra stripes on the XZ YZ plane and dots for the XY plane, and the algorithm automatically tries to make sense out of this and uh, ends up gener generating this fiber-like uh, structure. So uh, knowing this, one of the first things we tried to do using computer graphics technique in additive manufacturing was to use these techniques to define structures. So we thought, you know, we might as well replace the colors by black and white, where uh, black is empty, white is uh, solid and generate a structure and see what happens. But of course, the problem is you have to worry about structural soundness of your object. First, most of the time, a texture synthesizer will create disconnected components that will just fall apart, right? And then you have thickness issues, and the, the, the model may not be um, able to support its own weight, and so on. And so this algorithm we, we came up with works as follows. We first call the texture synthesizer, extract the structure that has been created, and look at its structural properties. We detect where there are issues, such as disconnections or weaknesses, and then we uh, heuristically reinforce the structures by adding some constraints where we say, okay, we want to add a beam here, this beam has to be solid, and then we call again the synthesizer under these constraints, right? And after a few iterations, this quickly converges to a structure that looks like the initial pattern, but is structurally sound. At worst, it would uh, completely fill the surface, right, and then stop. Okay, but fortunately, this does not happen in practice. Um, here is another uh, example. This one is a slightly different algorithm. This is where the idea is to distribute some elements while allowing some overlaps in a way that the overlaps look natural. They try to respect the geometry of the initial patterns. Um, and same thing, the uh, full layout is optimized for structural soundness so, yeah, so that you can 3D print your objects. Yet another technique, so this one uh, is actually a topology optimization uh, thing. Uh, the interesting idea with this is you're giving to the algorithm a mechanical, a structural problem, uh, and the structural problem for a chair says, okay, my chair is on the ground, I have some weights at some height, and I have some weights on the back. You give it, in this case, some elements, a number of them, these ones are deformable, these ones are not. You hit a button, and then you ask it, make it the shape that is the most rigid, given this. And then the algorithm is only allowed to move and, and try to deform a little bit these objects, and you end up with something that looks like a chair. But it really emerges from the constraints you gave. Now, same thing uh, working on plates. So here we give a pattern, we give the plates and some, uh, some forces, and if you look at the two tables on the left, they use the same amount, the same surface area, but we change the pattern, and this, produce, uh, this produces automatically different tables. Uh, this is very controllable, right? So if uh, you want like, to change the orientation of the patterns or the scale of the patterns, you can, of course, do that. So how does these uh, approaches work? Uh, the idea is to, uh, so I, I, I showed you different approaches, right? So here I'm just giving you the general way this works, but of course you have to look at the publications for, for actual details. So the idea is to combine structural optimization problems with uh, problems that are similar to, by example, texture synthesis. Right? And the tr a structural problem is defined by boundary conditions, such as I'm attached to the ground, and I, am some forces, uh, I have some forces abo above, and I want to generate a rigid shape. And of course, for these, there are great techniques, which comes from applied mathematics, which are topology optimization. You give a domain, you give some uh, uh, structural uh, problems, and you give some amount of material to the system, and it will generate the most rigid structure for this amount of material. Um, 
And then for the um, local geometry, the, the, the control you want to impose of a structure, the idea is, is as follows. You have a shape being synthesized on the right, and you're asking the optimizer to make sure that every neighborhood in the shape being synthesized will resemble at least one neighborhood in the original model. Right? And this is how we define this local geometry control. Right? And then you end up with this problem that we formulate with local geometry being something to optimize for, while rigidity is a constraint, because of course we're interested in knowing you know, how rigid it ends up being. Um, and to calibrate this constraint, we actually solve for the most rigid shape without the local geometry. Right? And having the most rigid shape, we relax the constraint, because otherwise you get the same shape. Right? So we relax this to allow, for instance, for 20% less rigid shape that's under your control. And this um, added flexibility in the system will be used by the optimizer to produce the appearance, right? And so to make the local geometry. Um, so that, that's how it goes. So we, are, we were very happy with this. This is quite promising. However, there's one tiny problem here is that it does not scale at all, right? So it works if you do simple, small things. But if you want to do something such as this, this is a very detailed foam uh, in, a, in a fairly big volume. It, it simply won't fit, right? Even the grid to represent this is, is going to be a problem to store in memory. And maybe you can come up with something that will work on a cluster or that will take you know, weeks to compute, but, but we don't want that, right? We want to do something different so that we can really uh, scale. And so, of course, what we did is we went you know, on the complete other side of the spectrum and started to think in, in terms of implicit representation. Um, so what does it mean, this implicit texturing? So again, the idea is to compute a color as opposed to uh, have, it, have it stored in an image or in a block of, of materials. Um, and so that might sound a bit, a bit magical, but um, you'll see that it's in fact, um, there's, actually, there's actually a methodology to build that. And this methodology uh, we, we was invented by uh, Ken Perlin in, in 1985, and here is what he, he had to say about this. So he said, naturalistic visual complexity is built up by composition of nonlinear functions, and powerful primitives are included for creating controlled stochastic effects. And this is a key. So given this, let me show you how I build this uh, planet uh, texture. Everything starts with a random seed. Um, and from this random seed, you're going to generate some controlled stochastic effects, which are what we, called, what we call noises. Right? And if you look at these three different layers of noises, they have a scale, there's a scale to them, right? And that's because their frequency content is carefully controlled, right? So the one at the, at, at the top has a coarser scale than the one at the bottom. And then if you uh, take them and do a blended sum, blended sum of them, you will end up with a pattern that, are, that has a richer spectral content. It has a richer frequency content. So it has more details and more interesting details. And then you enter the composition of nonlinear function. You fit that into, for instance, a color map, which is you take the 0, 1 value of the noise, and you look up into this table, and you will end up with a color field. Right? And that's, how, that's one recipe to build this planet. And in graphics, people have come up with all sorts of recipes to do all sorts of materials, not all of them, obviously, uh, even though we start to see methods that are able to do that from examples. But that remains challenging. Throughout this uh, uh, explanation, keep in mind that this is done at every pixel, right? It's not done on entire images. So everything here can be computed for a single pixel in constant time and constant memory cost, all right? And if you call that on all pixels on your screen in any order, you look at the result, then you get the coherent image. So how is this relevant to additive manufacturing? Well, here is a case where we define such a function f. It's a function of x, y, z plus a parameter p, and the parameter p allows you to vary the density of the structure from bottom to top. Now what happens is that as we stream the slices to the printer, we generate one slice by calling f in every pixel of the slice, send it to the printer, forget about it, generate the next one, send it to the printer, and so on and so forth. So this object actually never exists in computer memory. It only exists when you take it out of the printer. right? Um, and so that makes, of course, the process very efficient if you can write such a function. Now, okay, granted, it, it looks interesting, but what about the mechanical properties, for instance, right? So let's say we're interested in elasticity. Well, the thing is, um, the uh, driving, um, the, the driving uh, component in terms of the elastic uh, behavior is actually the function f and the parameters p. It doesn't really matter what the exact geometry inside is. 
And to show this, let, let me illustrate this by generating a first family of samples, these are little cubes, where we vary p, but p is constant in every cube. Right? So I generate the first family of cubes, I can put it under a mechanical testing machine, and I will get some uh, Young's modulus out of that. Now I can generate a second family, and what I do here is I use the same function f, of course, the same parameter p, but I change the random seed. The geometries are completely different in these things, right? They only share the function f and the value of p. And now if you put the second set of samples under the uh, testing machine, you will find out that for every column, you get a very similar elastic response. It's not identical, there's a little bit of variance, but it's uh, extremely similar. And so this lets you build this kind of curve where you can know that for given f, four values of p, you can compute the uh, uh, properties you will obtain for your problem, in this case, the relative Young's modulus. All right, so that's quite intriguing. Uh, but then there's one additional thing to keep in mind is that your functions f have to generate structures that are fabricable. So you have to do functions f such that you get a connected uh, structure with a thickness that is constrained and possibly without overhangs or without pockets, depending on the technology. And this is what we've been doing in the team. Basically, we've been exploring what kinds of functions f can you build that will have these properties. So here's one. You've seen that at the beginning. Uh, this one is defining an orthotropic uh, material, which means you can, uh, first, it can grade from isotropy to orthotropy, and it can follow an arbitrary direction field that you give as input, which will make the structure more rigid in one direction than in the other. Right? So you have complete freedom of grading. That's one uh, of the main interests in using stochastic structures, because you have no regularity, you have no periodicity, you can freely grade uh, most parameters. And you can actually feed that in a topology optimizer and uh, optimize for the parameters of your, of your foam, which behaves like a, like a composite, right? And you can see that if the foam is isotropic, it's gonna generate beams as you would do with solid and empty. If it's orthotropic, then it doesn't need to generate the beams because it can orient the fibers, so to speak, of the foam directly. And keep in mind, this is all procedural and generated from a function. Um, this one uh, that uh, we saw in the introduction is quite interesting as well because this is, a, this is a one that will work with your low-cost FDM printers. You can still control, uh, you, can go from, uh, you can control density, sorry, and you can go from uh, isotropic to orthotropic with a free direction of orthotropy in the XY plane. The Z plane is tricky due to the, over, the, the overhang angle. Um, this foam is, we can prove that it is uh, self-supported. So nowhere the overhang angle is exceeded and it doesn't produce any islands when you slice, so you don't need any support, because of course, having support in this would be a nightmare, right? This is a closed cell foam. Um, and here is a more recent uh, technique we developed. So this one is geared uh, towards multi-material, and it generates this sort of stri stripe patterns that you can uh, freely control. So here you have an example of two plates. So this one will accept the deformation, and the other one will fold, because it doesn't want to stretch uh, in, uh, in this direction. Um, what's interesting about it is that it's generated by um, um, uh, a procedural technique with a lot of different controls. So here you can see some control fields, right? And he, the other four columns are the results coming out when we control different parameters. In the first column, we control the scale of uh, the uh, stripes that are produced. And uh, again, uh, think of it as two materials, right? So white, white is one material and black is another one. Here we control the proportion of each material, right? Uh, in the third one, we control the directionality of the orthotropy. And in the, in the last one, we control everything together. Okay? And again, keep in mind, this is all done from a function which runs extremely fast, and you could actually paint this field and see the results being done on screen. Right? Or your optimizer could drive these things directly in, in any way you want. And so we can, for instance, put that on a plate such as this one. Here we have uh, some uh, uh, orthotropy on the sides, and in the middle you can see how interestingly it goes towards a more isotropic pattern, which will give the, um, uh, which will produce an isotropic material in the sense that you have the same response in all directions, right? So it doesn't have to trade off between choosing one of the orthotropic cases, it can really go towards something that is truly uh, isotropic. Okay, so to conclude, um, what I try to show you is that there's a very long history of uh, texturing techniques in graphics, and I think they are highly relevant to additive manufacturing. And there's a lot of cool techniques that I believe could be useful. Uh, I'm, not gonna through, uh, go, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but if you have questions uh, uh, afterwards, please uh, feel free to ask. Um, there's also concepts which we have in graphics for textures that uh, are likely useful to additive manufacturing. So some of them are filtering. So filtering is this idea that the content should adapt 
to the resolution with which lo you look at it. So if you think in terms of these foams I showed you, depending on your printer resolution, you, might, you, you, you could adapt this foam to the printer resolution, for instance. Uh, volume parameterization, we actually saw that with the uh, talk just before, where uh, we have these fancy parameterization techniques um, that can, for instance, uh, fit cubes into an arbitrary shape and so on, and this is, uh, I believe, very useful for uh, additive manufacturing. Vector field design, how to control the flow of things inside volumes, uh, specialized compression techniques, which will help you store your content better, and caches, which is more like a computational thing, but when you have to generate uh, extremely detailed and complex uh, textures, you can actually do a lot of, uh, of uh, nice computations and memory management. So uh, some further reading, I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't want to do a full history of things with, with too many references. Uh, we covered this book with uh, several co-authors and inside you will, you will really find a lot of references. We tried to go back in time and to really look also at what has been done in additive manufacturing in the 80s, 90s and so on. They actually, this book actually corresponds to state of the arts that were published at Geographic, so you can also find the PDF of the uh, state of the arts online. Um, so thank you very much. All the papers I talked about uh, are on our website. This is, of course, the work of many, many collaborators. Uh, I couldn't possibly cite them all here, uh, but uh, obviously uh, this is um, um, a, a very big team effort over several years. Um, and we try to create this software where we put most of our research. It's uh, free for research uses, so please feel free to try, feel free to try it. Uh, you can actually define your own implicit uh, geometries, implicit infills, and, uh, and uh, hopefully it might be useful for, for your research. Thank you very much.